A godly and learned sermon preached before an honourable auditory, the 26th day of February, 1580, by William Fulk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A godly and learned sermon preached in Lent last, 1580. The place of Scripture, most honourable and well-beloved in our Saviour Christ, which I have chosen to entreat of, is written in the 24th chapter of the second book of Samuel in these words. Verse 1. And the wrath of the Lord was yet more kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them in that he said, Go, number Israel and Judah, etc. The whole scripture of God, as the holy apostle St. James teacheth, is compared to a glass wherein all estates and degrees may see what to embrace and what to eschew, and it is commonly said of all histories that they are the looking-glasses of man's life. Therefore, this text being both a story and parcel of holy scripture, must needs be a most clear glass in which are represented unto us diverse things worthy to be seen and looked upon. Among which I have thought good to show unto you three especial and most notable images. The first is the justice and righteousness of God. The second is the malice of Satan. The third is the frailty of man, not meaning to describe them all at large, which would require much longer time than is granted to this exercise, but only to show every one of them, so far forth as it is set forth within the compass of this text which I have read unto you. Concerning the first, therefore, which is the justice of God, it is described in these words, And the wrath of God was yet more kindled against Israel, etc., By the wrath of the Lord is here meant the justice of God, provoked to punish sins, as in an hundred places of Scripture besides. By the wrath of the Lord, therefore, we must not understand any passion or disordered affection, such as is the wrath of man, of which the Apostle saith, that it worketh not the righteousness of God, but is often provoked with small causes, or with no worthy causes at all and yet boileth immoderately in the heart of man, whereby he is unmeasurably desirous of revengement. But the justice of God, which is figuratively called his wrath, is never stirred up to revengement, but upon great and weighty causes, neither rageth with blind fury, but keepeth a most perfect moderation in all things. And there are two reasons which may be yielded of this figurative speech, wherefore God's righteousness is called his wrath. The first is to strike through our hearts with terror of his justice, for the name of wrath is more terrible than the name of justice, and our nature is more familiarly acquainted with the one than with the other. The wrath of a man, if he be of power to hurt, is greatly feared. The wrath of a prince, saith Solomon in the sixteenth chapter of the Proverbs, is the messenger of death how much more the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in comparison of whose power and glory all earthly princes are but dust and ashes. The second reason why the justice of God is called the wrath of God is that we may learn and understand that as the wrath of man wherewith we are acquainted is not pacified but by two means, either by reconciliation or revengement, so it is with the justice of God. Therefore, whensoever we have provoked the wrath of God against us by our sins and wickedness, which we do daily and hourly, we must either seek to be reconciled to him by true repentance, or else look for sharp punishment. We must either humbly submit ourselves, acknowledge our offences, and humbly desire pardon, or else we must assure ourselves that the wrath of the Lord being once kindled against us, there is no way to escape vengeance." We see now, wherefore the justice of God is called the wrath of God. Now must we look for what cause the wrath of God was kindled against Israel, and how the Israelites had provoked the justice of God to punish them. 
the cause indeed is not set down in express words, but it is easy to gather by the effect, for it is manifest that when the justice of God is kindled against Israel, it is for none other cause but for their sins, and it is needless to inquire what particular sins were the cause. For it was not one or two, but all kinds of sins, and especially their unthankfulness. For the Lord had given them David, a most excellent governor, who both had established the purity and sincerity of God's true religion, and also had kept them in peace and tranquillity many years together. But as it usually cometh to pass through the corrupt nature of man, which is made insolent with prosperity, the people, not considering those great benefits of God, were not only unthankful to him for so happy a government, but followed every one the lusts of his own heart, not fearing to transgress the commandments of the Lord, but yet retaining an outward form of godliness by external exercise of religion, the virtue and power whereof they deny in life and conversation, and so provoked the wrath of the Lord of hosts to be kindled against them. But we must consider wherefore the scripture saith, The wrath of the Lord proceeded, or was yet more kindled. You must understand, as we read in the twenty-first chapter of this book, that the wrath of the Lord was kindled before this time against the people, so that he plagued them with three years' famine for the cruelty that Saul, to gratify them, committed against the Gibeonites, whom he had slain and sought to root out, contrary to a covenant which their ancestors had made, and confirmed with a solemn oath in the days of Joshua. These three years of hunger were now past, and this was the fourth year in which God, after he had avenged the blood of the Gibeonites upon the posterity of Saul, had restored plenty and abundance of all things for the maintenance of man's life, with external peace and prosperity. For which benefits and blessings of God bestowed upon them, they were bound to have served God in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of their life, like as by the former plague they were admonished to forsake their sins, which were the cause thereof, and truly to turn to him. But they, clean contrarywise, abusing his mercy, took occasion to provoke his justice, even as the froward nature of man is, so long as they are plagued, and the hand of the Lord is heavy on them, they humble themselves before him, or at least pretend so to do, but when the plague is ceased, they find themselves relieved, they return again to their former wickedness. So was it with the Israelites. They had been punished with famine, but they were not thereby reformed, and therefore the wrath of the Lord is still kindled against them. By which example we ought to be admonished that we deceive not ourselves after the manner of the world, to think that the wrath of the Lord shall be turned from us before we turn from our sins. Wherefore, let us not flatter ourselves as the reprobate do, when they have escaped some particular punishment. This danger is overcome, this brunt is past, this storm is blown over, etc. For so long as we continue in our sins, and seek not to be reconciled unto the Lord, the wrath of the Lord will be still kindled against us, yea, more and more provoked to punish us, and if one plague be ceased, another shall begin. When famine is stayed, the pestilence shall rage, and if that will not reform us, some other plague shall be sent upon us. The Lord can want no whips, so long as his wrath is bent to scourge us. Therefore let us not obstinately set ourselves against him, to try whether he will be sooner wearied in striking, or we in bearing his stripes. But let us humbly and at once cast down ourselves, acknowledge our sins, be sorry for them, and forsake them, and then the way to reconciliation shall be opened by our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, in whom the Lord shall be pleased with us, and his wrath pacified towards us. We have further to note the reason of the metaphor, when the Holy Ghost saith, the wrath of the Lord was kindled, which kind of speech is very often used in the scripture to compare the wrath of God to fire, whose force, when it hath taken strength, cannot easily be stayed, and whose property is to consume all things that ministereth matter unto it. And for that cause, the Lord himself, in respect of his justice, is called a consuming fire. 
to the end, therefore, that we should stand in fear of God's justice, and that we should be as careful not to provoke his wrath against us, as we are careful not to minister matter unto fire, which will be ready to consume ourselves and all that ever we have. Our God is said to be a consuming fire, and the wrath of the Lord is said to be kindled against us. Therefore, as there is no dallying with fire, when any light substance is near, which is ready to take flame, so there is no dissembling before God, the fire of whose wrath and justice is kindled with our sins and wickedness. For, as the Lord hateth and abhorreth all sins and ungodliness, so his justice is kindled like fire against the same, to purge and cleanse the world of all unrighteousness. Let not sinners therefore think to stand in his presence, which is a consuming fire, before whom they shall melt even as wax, and vanish away as smoke, before whom they shall be as stubble and chaff, that is set on fire and cannot be quenched. And let us which trust in his mercy not be high-minded, but stand in awe of his justice, and provoke not his wrath to be kindled against us through our manifold sins and wickedness, whose wrath if it be but a little kindled, as the prophet saith, no man is able to stand in the presence of his justice, but it will appear how happy they are which put their trust in his mercy. And if the wrath of God, being but a little kindled, hath so notable effect, what is to be looked for when it is wholly inflamed in fury against us, for gross and manifest contempt of his glorious majesty? For as contempt in men is the chiefest cause in provoking them to anger, and the greatest contempt provoketh the greatest anger, so it is with the Lord, whose justice is despised in all sin and disobedience of his law, but chiefly in that profane and professed contempt which we see to bear the sway among great numbers of the wicked, which openly and without all fear of his justice have sold themselves like Ahab, to commit all manner of sin with greediness. Thus we see what this Spirit of God meaneth, when he saith the wrath of God was yet more kindled against Israel. Now we have to consider how it standeth with the justice and righteousness of God, that Israel, having provoked the wrath of God, the heart of David is moved to number the people, that the wrath of the Lord being kindled against Israel, he stirred up David against them. For it seemeth contrary to reason that the people, having deserved punishment, the Lord should deal with the prince for them. But, for so much as the prince is, as it were, an helm or stern by which the Lord governeth the whole commonality of people which the Lord hath committed to their charge, it standeth well with his justice and wisdom also to move and stir up the prince against them, whensoever their transgressions shall provoke his righteousness to chasten them. And even so, saith Solomon, Proverbs 21, as the streams of waters, or as it is now translated, as a vessel in the streams of waters, so is the king's heart in the hand of the Lord, and whithersoever he will, he inclineth and moveth it, either to the haven of prosperity, if the people serve him, or to the shore of danger and adversity, if they provoke his wrath against them. Therefore, as the stirring of a ship by the master directeth the ship whither he thinketh good. Even so the Lord moveth the hearts of all princes, which are as the stern of the ship of the commonwealth in his hand, that they are not carried at all adventure whither the stream of waters will drive them, but whithersoever it pleaseth him, either to the great and singular benefit of that people which feareth the Lord, or for the correction and punishment of them which transgress his laws and contemn his justice. Ye hear now how well it agreeth, not only with the justice, but also with the wisdom of God, that he should move the heart of the king according to the disposition of the people. Besides this, we must also understand that, as princes are public persons in respect of their government of whole nations committed to their charge, so also before the Lord they are private persons, to be called to account not only for such things as they do in their public government, but also for such offences as they commit privately as the sons of Adam. Among which there is none found so righteous, 
but that in many things they transgress the law of God, and therefore the justice of God is not to be accused of any unrighteousness when the people have provoked his wrath. And David cannot justify himself before him if he stir up David's heart against the people for their punishment, and take occasion of the people's sins to punish David himself. For although here is no transgression of David expressed, whereby he might seem to have brought this punishment upon him, yet David himself will confess that there was always sufficient cause in him why the Lord might chastise him. For so he acknowledgeth in the 51st Psalm, that not only for that gross and notorious sin of adultery and murder he had deserved God's vengeance, but generally he accuseth his whole life of sin and transgression of God's laws, that the wrath of God in his punishments, whatsoever it should please him to lay on him, might of all the world be acknowledged to be just and righteous. For thus he crieth, Against thee, against thee, O Lord, I have sinned. That is, I have done nothing but sinned, and done that which is evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and have the upper hand when thou art judged. And lest we should think that he speaketh of some short time of his life, in which the devil had so greatly prevailed with him, he declareth in the next verse that it was even from his nativity, yea, from his conception, that this corruption hath remained in him, which is contrary to the righteousness of God. Behold, saith he, I was born in sin, and in iniquity did my mother conceive me, whereas thou lovest truth in the inward parts. This confession of David, therefore, is sufficient to clear the Lord from all unrighteousness, and to show manifestly that David is not punished for the people's sins as an innocent, which hath deserved nothing in his own person, nor is beaten altogether for the faults of other men, which could not stand with God's righteousness, except in that case where our Saviour Christ willingly offered himself to be punished for our transgressions. But here the Israelites, provoking the wrath of God, deserved that a good governor should decline out of the right course for their punishment. And David himself cannot deny, but that whensoever the Lord shall chastise him, he shall not do it without his deserts so that every way it standeth with God's righteousness, that Israel, having caused his wrath to be kindled against him, he should stir up David, whom he had given to them, being a most excellent prince for their benefit, now to give occasion of their punishment. But against this doctrine of the justice and righteousness of God, two kinds of adversaries do rise up. The first are the Pelagians and Papists, so far as they agree with the Pelagians. The second are the atheists, the former sort reason after this manner. If you say that God moved David to number the people, which was sin, do you not thereby make God the author of sin? God forbid, let God only be righteous and all men sinners. For he only is holy, he only is pure from all corruption, and there is no unrighteousness in him. But how can you avoid that inconvenience? say they, that followeth of this assertion, God moved David to do that wherewith he was displeased, therefore he was the cause of the sin in David. It is easily avoided, for the same story is set down in 1 Chronicles 21st chapter, where it is said that Satan, or the adversary, stood up against Israel, and moved the heart of David to number the people. By conference of which place of scripture with this my text, we may see how God moved David to number the people, and yet moveth him to no sin. For whereas it is here said that the Lord was angry with Israel and moved David against them, for we cannot aptly understand any other but either the Lord or the wrath of the Lord which moved him, and in the Chronicles it is said that Satan moved him, it is manifest that God and the devil concur in one action, God as a most righteous judge and Satan as a most malicious enemy by which we see that there proceedeth nothing from God but justice, and that the sin which is evil cometh from the devil, so that the Lord God, although he be the first mover in all our actions, for in him we live and move and have our being, yet he is not the author or cause of any evil in us. Nevertheless, 
he useth Satan to punish us, who, although he be a malicious enemy, yet is he a minister of the righteous judgment of God, although against his will, and even then when he opposeth himself against God. For Satan is not suffered to reign and rage at his pleasure against the elect of God, for then he would in one moment overthrow the whole church of Christ, but kept in chains of darkness, so that he cannot stir, but where and when it pleaseth God, in justice to use his ministry and service. Therefore, when the wrath of the Lord was kindled against Israel, Satan also standeth up against Israel as a minister of God's wrath, by necessity of God's ordinance, though a cruel adversary by his own will and malicious affection, so that neither by colour of this text nor of any other in the whole scripture the Lord can be charged as the cause of the same evil which he punisheth either in the elect or in the reprobate, for whatsoever proceedeth from him as it proceedeth from him is good, and to a good end, who useth well even Satan the adversary of all goodness, and his members the reprobate, and so ordereth, bridleth, and governeth their sins and wickedness, that even their evil he turneth to good, and out of their wickedness, as it were, light out of darkness bringeth his glory. So he hardened the heart of Pharaoh, yet was he not the cause of Pharaoh's sin, but the cause was in Pharaoh himself, who of his own corruption did set himself against God, and of Satan who ruleth in the reprobate, and stirreth him up to rebellion, and obstinate resisting of God's commandments. Thus was the heart of Pharaoh hardened by God, as by a righteous judge, by Satan as by a malicious enemy against God and mankind, by Pharaoh himself as a man who, being clean void of God's spirit, by corruption of his own nature, is inclined to nothing but to contempt and disobedience of God, and the whole matter so ordered in all points by the divine providence that the glory of his justice might be set forth in Pharaoh's destruction, even as the Lord saith unto him, Even for this cause have I stirred thee up, that I might show forth my power in thee, and that my name might be renowned in all the world. Therefore the same God which maketh an hypocrite to reign for the sins of the people, and giveth a king in his fury, whom he taketh away again in his indignation, as the prophet saith, even the same God, by the same authority, wisdom, and justice, moveth David, a good king, against Israel, that he might punish them without all contagion or infection of the sin and evil by which he was moved to number the people, which caused God to punish them, so that, although God giveth the first moving power and strength in all manner of actions, which we must confess to be good, as proceeding from him, and ordereth and disposeth all evil, which is a perverting of the good which cometh from God, and proceedeth from Satan and the corruption of man's nature, so that he converteth the same always in the end to his glory and the benefit of his elect, as we see in the persecution of the wicked and the infirmities of the godly. Yet is he by no means to be charged as the author and cause of sin and evil, if this will not satisfy you, but that you will further urge me with that question of the Manichees, whence cometh evil, seeing nothing but good cometh from God, and yet you affirm that God is the cause of all things. I will answer as I have learned out of the ancient writers who were troubled by the sect of the Manichees, which affirmed that there were two beginnings. When it pleased the Almighty to show forth his infinite power, wisdom and goodness in the creation of things visible and invisible, bodily and spiritually, it pleased him for the illustration and setting forth of the glory of his goodness to ordain, for so they have taught me to speak, that evil should proceed out of the free will of his reasonable creatures. And this his ordinance is good, for although evil be naught, and cursed be he that saith evil is good, yet that there should be evil which is God's ordinance, it is excellent good. If this seems strange to any man, I will make it plain by two manifest reasons. The first is, the excellency of goodness cannot so well appear and be known as by the comparison of the contrary, which is evil. Therefore it is perfect good that evil should be for the manifestation of that which is good. We see that in all the creatures and works of the world, God hath ordained that his glory should shine in contraries. 
as to the intent that the beauty and glory of light should be seen and known to be such as it is, he hath ordained darkness. For if he had created light to be perpetual without any change of darkness, how had it been possible for men, although living in the light, to have known the excellency of light, and so should God have been defrauded of the glory of so beautiful, profitable, and comfortable a creature? Therefore, even as by darkness we learn how to esteem light, and by bitter that which is sweet, and every other thing by his contrary, even so by the deformity of evil we are taught how great is the excellent comeliness of that which is good. Therefore the ordinance of God that there should be evil is perfect good. Although this reason be plain enough, yet the second reason is more manifest, even to the meanest capacities. For that the glory of God's mercy might appear in the salvation of his elect, and his justice in the condemnation of the reprobate, it was necessary that there should be evil, and so necessary that otherwise there should have been no matter for the mercy and justice of God to work upon. For if there should have been no sin nor evil, wherein should the mercy of God in pardoning and forgiving of sins have been seen? If there should have been no transgression, how should the glory of God's justice have shined in punishment? Ye see, therefore, that God by no means may be counted the author of evil, which he hath not created, made, or wrought, but ordained that it should proceed from the free will of his reasonable creatures for the illustration of his glory. Let us therefore tremble at his righteous judgments, who doth all things according to the good pleasure of his will, and hath made the wicked man for the day of his wrath, as Solomon testifieth, and yet by no means is the cause of his wickedness. If any man be not satisfied with this answer, he may enter further into the unmeasurable depth of God's judgment, into which he may rather find an entrance than a way out, except it be to his everlasting destruction for his horrible presumption. You have heard now the justice of God defended against the Pelagians and Papists, it followeth that I speak something to the confutation of the second enemies thereof, which are the atheists, who, because they will not be troubled with such thorny and doubtful questions as these are, imagine that they have found an easy way unto wisdom and a solution for all controversies of religion when they say in their hearts that there is no God, against whose impiety and madness the time will not serve me to speak so much as their wickedness deserveth, and yet if time would permit Never so large a discourse I could say, in effect, no more against them than the prophet David writeth in the fourteenth psalm. Amar Hanaval, the greatest and most doltish fool of all fools, hath said in his heart, There is no God. But what meaneth the prophet so to befool them, when, of all other men they are, or would seem to be, the finest witted, the best learned, and most full of all wisdom and knowledge, even because of all other they are most void of all true wisdom, which, although they fancy to themselves that they only have found, yet is there not one among an hundredth that dare acknowledge it. A goodly wisdom that they are ashamed to profess and stand in defence of it, for although they nourish that monster in their hearts, and are bold sometimes to show forth the same, when they think themselves to be the best learned, Yet is there not one of them that dare encounter with a Christian philosopher to maintain by reason that which they hold against all reason? They object, perhaps, you will oppress them with the authority of God's word and the holy scriptures, whereunto they give no credit. Nay, we will lay the Bible aside and dispute with them out of the great book, even out of the beautiful theatre of the world, in whose creation and preservation, if they cannot read in great capital letters, the almighty power, wisdom, and goodness, and the justice and mercy of God in the government thereof, they are the most blind, blockish, and unsensible of all other creatures. And yet they fancy in their frenzy that they have found out the greatest and the deepest point of wisdom when they are fallen into the greatest absurdity or folly that can be. For what can be more contrary to reason than to affirm an effect without a cause, or to follow their dreams an eternal effect, without an eternal cause. Therefore the Holy Ghost most aptly exprobateth unto them extreme folly, because by their monstrous position of denying God, they take away the fountain of all knowledge and wisdom, that is the cause of all things. 
but as the ass yieldeth to no other reason but to a club, so they are more worthy to be knocked down with a beetle than to be confuted with any reason, which no less than the authority of God's word written in the scriptures and the law of nature written in the hearts of all nations is most contrary and repugnant to their most foolish and damnable persuasion. The Lord deliver us from the devices, practices, and doings of the atheists. As for their wit, learning, wisdom, and reason in which they please themselves above other men, we are nothing afraid of it. They durst take upon them the defence of their devilish persuasion, and let them assure themselves that the justice of God, which now they condemn, they shall hereafter feel, and howsoever they would fly from it, it shall find them at the length, whereof a testimony also remaineth still in their conscience, which the prophet in the psalm forgetteth not to note where it saith, There have they feared, where there is no cause to fear. For of all other these profane atheists can so boldly and lustily despise God and his righteousness in any appearance of danger, yea, where no danger at all is, are most fearful cowards and trembling dastards, and no marvel, for what good courage can there be, where there is no hope but in this life, nor comfort of help but in men which are not able to help themselves, but I am to blame to use too much speech against them who either hear it not, or, though they heard it, would not make account of it, saying that it is not unprofitable for the godly and religious to have the madness of these men made manifest, that they may the more detest them, and better beware of them. Thus have you heard the justice of God delivered from the malice of the greatest enemies thereof. God grant that as many of them as be recoverable may in time see against whom they have been bold to oppose themselves, and, understanding how little it is possible for them to prevail, they may no more kick against the prick, nor strive against the streams, but in all humility and submission, acknowledging their heinous rebellion, they may desire rather to be relieved by his mercy than by contending any longer to try the rigour of his justice. One other thing more to be noted in this example of God's justice, which the scripture testifieth, that the Lord in his wrath remembereth his mercy towards his elect, and that appeareth in this history. For when the people have provoked the wrath of the Lord to be kindled against them, and that he in justice was to procure a punishment and correction for their amendment, yet he so ordered the whole matter by his merciful and divine providence, that in the end it turned to the singular benefit of his church, so that even the rod by which he scourgeth them was a demonstration of his mercy towards them. For, as it appeareth in the twenty-second chapter of the book of Chronicles, by occasion of the plague which God sent for the punishment of the people's sins, David found out the place which the Lord had appointed for the building of his temple. Marvellous, therefore, is the providence of the Lord, which, as the wise man saith, extendeth itself from end to end mightily, and disposeth all things sweetly, and wonderful is the loving kindness and mercy of God towards his elect, which even then, when his wrath is kindled against them, forgetteth not, like a most loving father, in chastening of their faults, to seek their amendment, and to change the very correction and punishment itself into a singular benefit and blessing. For what a singular benefit was it to all the church of Israel, when the Lord had appointed his resting place in Zion, and the building of his temple in Jerusalem, which place the Lord revealed by occasion of this punishment, and David perceived that the Lord had heard his prayer, when he sacrificed in the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite, so that the angel was commanded to put up his sword, and the pestilence was stayed from raging any longer among the people. Wherefore we see that, although the justice of God in his punishment be terrible for the time, yet in the end he turneth all to the benefit of the faithful, by which we learn not to be faint-hearted or discouraged when the Lord's wrath is kindled against us, but with patience to bear his anger when we have sinned against him, and with the eyes of faith to behold his mercy, which he never forgetteth towards his chosen, no, not when he dealeth most sharply with them. For not only his rod and staff, as the prophet saith, shall comfort us, as they are the tokens of his fatherly chastisement for our reformation, 
but also the very means which he provideth for our punishment, he converteth often time to our benefit. Thus doth faith overcome the terror of God's justice, when it assureth us that it is so far off that the same should take any place against us for our destruction, inasmuch as it is satisfied by the death of Jesus Christ, that contrarywise his punishments are merciful and his chastisements are beneficial unto us. Only let us take heed that we despise not his long suffering in his favourable correction, lest with the wicked we procure his wrath to be upon us unto the end. Another lesson we have to learn in this example of God's justice, as profitable in all ages, so most necessary in our time. The wrath of the Lord was here kindled against Israel, for whose punishment David is moved to number the people, whence now proceedeth the cause of this punishment, not from the government of David, but from the sins of the people. For while the people please God and serve him according to his word, he blessed David for their benefit in all his consolations and affairs. But when the people provoke the wrath of God against them, then is David made an instrument for their punishment. It is not unlike, but the people in David's time, among other their sins by which they provoked God's punishment, were also infected in this vice that they took upon them, as it is usual with people that are unthankful for the great travail which princes bestow in their government, to enter into finding a fault with the state of regiment, and to remove the cause of their punishments from themselves unto him who had less deserved it. Nevertheless, the Holy Ghost testifieth plainly that the cause of this plague was not the ill demeanour of David, but the sins of Israel. Let Israel therefore walk in the ways of the Lord, and serve him with an upright heart, and there shall be no error in the government of David, but he shall have a prosperous reign over them. A lesson very needful for the people of our days, who were never so curious to inquire of princes' causes and matters of the state, of which, for want of knowledge, they are meet to be no judges, although they had authority, as they be in this time. But, sirs, you forget your place. God hath made you subjects and not governors, to be governed and not to rule. Enter not, therefore, neither intermeddle you with princes' matters, but enter into yourselves, and look that your sins and wickedness do not cause an error to be in the government, for if there be any at any time, it proceedeth from you. Your sins are the cause, as it appeareth plainly in this example. The sins of Israel provoked the Lord to wrath, and then David's heart is moved to number the people. From whence proceed ill humours which trouble the head and cause it to ache? Out of the head? No, they ascend out of the body into the head, and so causeth the head to ache. And then the aching of the head is the disquietness of the body, and yet the cause is not in the head, but in the ill humours which proceed from the body. Take heed, therefore, that ye minister no ill humours out of the body into the head, and the head shall be well enough able to govern the body. Look, therefore, to the purging of the body from sin and wickedness, that no distemperance thereby do rise into the head, and doubt you not but the Lord God, as he hath always hitherto, so will he from henceforth direct the head to your singular benefit, quietness and commodity. And in this behalf we have earnestly to pray to the Lord for the preservation of our sovereign, considering how greatly we have provoked his wrath, and given him just cause to withdraw his bountiful graces from her, which hitherto it hath pleased him most plenteously to bestow upon her highness to our singular benefits and comfort. And likewise we have to praise and magnify the Lord for his infinite mercy, declared in his long-suffering and patience towards us, who notwithstanding we have so often and so much provoked him to indignation through our manifold transgressions, contempt of his word and unthankfulness. Yet hath he so blessed her estate and government, and that for so long time over us, that, searching all monuments of stories from the beginning, the like examples of prosperous and peaceful regiment shall never be found. I say, the like happiness and quiet government in all godliness and honesty for so many years together is not to be showed in this land out of any records of antiquity. Turn over the book hardly and spare not, 
and bring me forth no small examples, but only such as our most sovereign lady may vouchsafe to excel, if ever the like prosperous and godly estate can be showed of so long continuance. Let us therefore yield glory unto his majesty, from whose only goodness this, as all other good gifts have proceeded, and thankful obedience unto her highness, whom he hath used as a means and instrument to procure all this happiness unto us. And as we have thus long enjoyed this blessed government, so that we may enjoy it twice as many years or more, if it be his will, let us become humble suitors to our Heavenly Father, that he will bless her majesty with long life to the glory of his name, and the benefit of his church. But especially considering we have provoked the Lord's wrath to be kindled against us, let us make haste to be reconciled unto him, by unfeigned and hearty repentance and amendment of life, for when the Lord shall see us turned truly unto him, he will turn from the fierceness of his wrath, and turning away from us all such plagues and punishments as we most righteously have deserved, he will turn unto us the cheerful light of his countenance in Jesus Christ, in whom and for whom he is well pleased with us. And thus much touching the righteousness of God, which is the first part. The second point we have to consider is the malice of Satan, which is noted to us in the 21st chapter of the first book of Chronicles, where it is said that Satan stood up against Israel and moved the heart of David to number the people. Although the malice of Satan be manifold and almost infinite, yet I will note it in two points only out of this text. First, in the person with whom he dealeth, and secondly, in the sin wherewith he provoketh him. Concerning the first, it is said that Satan stood up against Israel and moved the heart of David. For when God's wrath was kindled against Israel, Satan was God's minister to execute his just judgment, not of obedience to God, but of malice to Israel. Therefore, how doth he execute it? He goeth straight to David. For Satan, finding himself loosed of that chain by which he is restrained from assaulting the people of God, whom he defendeth with his grace, and boiling in malice against the church of God, whose prosperity he envieth, and seeketh her destruction. Immediately he setteth upon the chief governor thereof. All his malice is against the church of God, and therefore it is said, Satan stood up against Israel. But he, knowing where to do most mischief, beginneth to show his malice against David. He seeketh to infect the head, that he might destroy the whole body. He knoweth that a godly and virtuous prince is the principal instrument that God useth against men to procure the wealth of his church and chosen people, and therefore, of hatred against the church and rancor against God's people, he seeketh by all means to corrupt a good prince and to cause a godly governor to be unprofitable to them. See therefore how great cause we have with earnest and daily prayers to commend unto the gracious protection of our God the preservation of our godly prince and sovereign. Because we see the malice of Satan to be so great that whensoever he is let loose to stand up against Israel he will begin his assault, where he knoweth he may do most hurt to the church of God. And therefore, not without cause, the apostle so vehemently exhorteth that prayers, supplications, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made, specially for kings and all that be in authority, because Satan's malice, which he beareth against God's church, he seeketh specially to execute by them whose power is greatest, and whose example carrieth the multitude after them. For even as the Lord in wisdom and justice useth to punish the people by their princes, even so Satan, of hatred and malice, seeketh the overthrow of the church by the same persons. The second point, wherein the malice of Satan is to be considered, is the vice or sin whereunto he moved the heart of David. The text saith, He moved David to number the people. For a prince to number and muster his people, of itself it is no sin but a thing indifferent of his own nature, which at some time is not only lawful to do, but also necessary, and therefore it is no hard matter to gather what sin David committed in numbering the people, namely his heart by Satan, contrary to his former faith and humble trust in God's promises, was lifted up with pride and presumption. For having no lawful cause, either ecclesiastical, to levy a subsidy for the maintenance of God's religion, 
as Moses prescribeth in the 30th of Exodus, or else civil, as was oftentimes lawfully practised in time of war. He alleggeth only his vain curiosity, that he might know the number of them. Thus did Satan begin to plant the root of pride and insolency in the heart of David, which, as it is a vice in all men most odious, so to be in a prince is most dangerous, and that for many causes. All which Satan did well foresee when he maketh his assault unto David with the sin of presumption first of all, for that of all other vices princes are most easily drawn to pride and insolency, both because the nature of all men is most prone and apt to fall into pride in prosperity, and for that princes and higher states, being advanced to such greatness above all other men, have so many occasions to be puffed up with presumption, if they be not mightily and marvellously defended by the singular grace of God. So that a prince that is humble and lowly in heart is one of the greatest miracles of the world, and indeed so great a wonder that it can not be brought to pass but by him which only worketh great marvels. Thus Satan, being most malicious and most subtle in his malice, to bring his purpose to effect more speedily, useth such a means by which he may work most easily. Neither hath he regard only to the easiness of his enterprise, but that the same also is most apt to overthrow the church and people of God. For by pride and insolency, most of all other vices, a prince is made unapt to exercise his office and duty. The office of a king standeth in two points. The first is, in maintenance of true religion. The second is provision for the commonwealth and public peace of his subjects. But neither of these can he exercise to the glory of God and benefit of men, if his heart be overcome with presumption. For touching the first, if pride possess the heart of a king, he will either neglect religion altogether, or else think that he may do and decree in religion what he list. If he neglect the cause of religion, he will have no regard to set out God's glory. He passeth not whether the word of God be preached or not preached, whether the sacraments be ministered or not ministered, discipline exercised or not, or whether all things be well done or ill done. Finally, he careth not whether religion goeth backward or forward. But if he will intermeddle with religion with a presumptuous and insolent mind, he will imagine that all things in religion are subject to his will and pleasure. Uzziah, otherwise not the worst prince, was so lifted up with pride that he usurped the priest's office and would needs offer incense, but he was plagued for his presumption and stricken of the Lord with a leprosy. Achaz commanded Uriah the high priest to remove the altar of the Lord out of his place, and to set up another altar of another fashion, according to the pattern which he sent him from Damascus. Jeroboam thinketh it lawful for him to change the decree of God concerning worshipping at Jerusalem, and setteth up a new form of worship in Dan and Bethel. Saul thinketh long to tarry for Samuel, and offereth sacrifice without him. These examples and many other do show how dangerous to the state of religion is the sin of pride and presumption in the heart of a prince. No marvel, therefore, if Satan, which maliceth most the good proceedings in religion, that he might undermine the tower of the church to the utter overthrow of the same, prepareth his way by puffing up the king's heart with pride and insolency, knowing that he which is proud and insolent towards men cannot be humble and obedient unto God. The second part of the office of a king is to provide for the commonwealth, the peace and prosperity of his subjects, which cannot be without great travail and labour of mind and body. But if the prince be overcome with pride, he will never abase himself to take such great pains as he ought to do for the benefit of other men in so difficult and dangerous a matter. Therefore Moses, in the 17th of Deuteronomy, when he describeth what manner a king is to be chosen by the Israelites, and what is the office of a king when he is elected, joineth both these parts together, and for the performance of the latter, especially admonisheth them to beware of presumption. When the king, saith he, shall sit upon the throne of his kingdom, he shall write out by a copy received of the priests a book of the law of the Lord, 
and that shall be with him to read therein all the days of his life, that he may prosper and learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of the law to do them. Thus having prescribed the book of the law to be the direction of his government, as well in religion as in affairs of the commonwealth, to which burden that the king might submit his shoulders and not think scorn to bear it, he addeth immediately that his heart be not lift up above his brethren. What meaneth Moses by this, that a king should not show himself to be a king? When by God's ordinance he is advanced and lifted up above all other men, no, verily, he meaneth not so, but that the king is lifted up above his brethren, to be a father unto them, and to have a fatherly care which he cannot have, if his heart be lifted up above them to contemn them. Whereas he ought not only to retain his love to them, which he had before he was a king, as unto his brethren, but also to put a greater affection of love when he is a king, as of a father towards his children." Wherefore, the meaning of Moses is that the king's heart should not be lifted up above his brethren to contemn them, to tread them under feet, to exercise tyranny over them, but to be humble and lowly-minded of love, willingly and cheerfully to take such travails and to overcome such difficulties as is necessary for all them which shall govern well and to the profit of others. We see that natural parents, which have the greatest authority over their children of whom they are to be honoured, notwithstanding their dignity, do willingly and gladly endure any travail which they think may be profitable and beneficial to their children. Even so, the parents of the country, whose honour and obedience is confirmed unto them by none other, but even by the same commandment, not disdain any labour, travail, or industry which is necessary to be employed for the wealth and preservation of their subjects. But such princes as have not learned out of God's law to be humble, neither are led with the meek spirit of Christ, but with the proud spirit of Satan, will either think scorn to take pains for the safety of their inferiors, or else by violence oppress them and tread them under feet as though to govern were nothing else but to command. Whereas, clean contrarywise, as that noble Emperor Theodosius said, to govern is to take charge of the health, wealth, and prosperity of other men, which charge is so much the greater as they are more in number, which are under their government. And whereas every man findeth enough to do to take care for himself and his own well-being, we see how heavy is the burden of princes, and them that be in authority, which have the charge, and are to provide for the safety of so many, and that with such a condition that if any one do perish through their negligence or misgovernment, his blood shall be required at their hands. That vice, therefore, by which they are made unapt and unwilling to take so great a charge upon them, how dangerous it is. Satan was not ignorant when he tempted David with pride, as we may easily see. But all the danger is not yet expressed. For whereas it is not possible that any one person, though his wisdom, care, and diligence be never so great, should bear the whole burden himself of any great government or kingdom, all good governors have thought it necessary to use the assistance of wise and faithful counsel, so that in matters of religion they would decree nothing without the advice of them which are learned in the word of God, and in matters of the commonwealth they would attempt nothing but by the counsel of them that are wise in politic affairs, thinking truly that to be subject to wisdom is to rule most honourably. But where pride prevaileth with any prince, he will neither give ear to the messenger of God that shall speak unto him out of the law of God touching religion, nor follow the prudent advice of trusty counsellors, which shall inform him in matters pertaining to the commonwealth, by which it is not possible that either the one or the other can be well ordered and governed. Therefore great is the danger both unto the church and to the commonwealth, where the prince groweth to be insolent and opinionative, that always thinking himself to see most clearly in every matter, he disdaineth to be directed after any counsel or advice that can be given by any man. And therefore Solomon saith, Seest thou one that is wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. And this began to appear even in this example of David. 
for when Satan had stuffed his mind with a proud desire to know his forces, he giveth no ear to Joab, that with some reasons sought to dissuade him from so vain an enterprise. Thus presumption causeth princes to shut their ears against godly and prudent advice of their counsellors, and that which is worse, when pride hath overcome the prince's heart, he shall hardly find any that will give faithful and profitable counsel. For when the king's humour is once perceived, that he will hear no counsel which is contrary to his affection, few or none will adventure to speak the truth which they know will purchase themselves displeasure. So the king, being not defended with faithful and trusty counsellors, lieth open to clawbacks and flatterers, which will devour him whilst he is alive worse than any wild beasts which prey only upon dead carcasses. You see the drift of Satan's malice in provoking the prince to pride, to leave him bare of all such necessary helps as he may have rightly to discharge his office. But, being destitute of all assistance upon earth, is there any aid true you to be looked out for of heaven? No, verily, for by pride the king maketh himself uncapable of that, whereby all princes, in solemn title, profess that they do reign, namely, the grace of God, without which, as it is not possible for any prince to govern well, so no prince can be partaker thereof that is thrall to pride and enemy to humility. For God hath said in express words that he resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to none but such as are humble of heart, how then can they prosper which have God to their open enemy, which are void of all the grace of God, without which no king dare affirm that he is able to govern well? Wherefore it were a good remembrance for all kings and princes, whensoever they read or hear their style rehearsed, that they would be admonished how necessary it is for them to be endued with humility, which, if they be not, they may be well assured never to partake of God's graces, to the good government of their realms, and discharge of their conscience, whatsoever they pretend in their titles. Last of all, the conversion from this period of pride and presumption is so dangerous, no less for the state of a prince than for the safety of every other person, that the most wise Solomon, who well considered the beginning, proceeding, and end of all things, which is the ground of wisdom, doubteth not to affirm in the sixteenth of his Proverbs that pride goeth before destruction, and a high mind before the fall. This, when Satan knew by experience of his own fall and destruction, he tempted David to pride, whereof not only the inconveniences before rehearsed might ensue, but also the final overthrow and confusion of David and his kingdom might follow. The Lord which preserved David that Satan's malice had no full effect in him, defend all Christian princes from the like temptation, and give them true humbleness of heart with all such graces and gifts of his Holy Spirit as are needful to discharge so high a calling. The third and last part I promised to entreat of is the frailty of man, which in this text is offered to be considered in two persons. First in the person of David, and secondly in the person of Joab, Concerning David, I need not stand long in discovering his frailty, not only at this time, but at other times also, as it is set forth in the scripture how excellent a man he was, and how plentifully endued with the graces and gifts of God, how noble a king, and how godly a prophet, I shall not need to describe. He is sufficiently known unto you, and yet he is not exempted from the common fragility of men." He is highly commended in the scriptures, and his example alleged for a pattern of all good kings that followed him, and yet you see his chronicle is blotted with this and two or three other offences, of whose fall we ought to make this profit to ourselves, that therein we may see our own weakness, and when we see our own frailty in another man's faults, we may be admonished thereby to pray unto the Lord, for the continual and mighty assistance of his Holy Spirit, that seeing our weakness is so great, we may always find his grace, whose power is made perfect in infirmity, to be sufficient for us, so that, although of frailty we fall often, yet by grace we may always rise again, so that we never fall away. Finally, we have need, I say, in respect of our infirmity, to pray for strength earnestly to God, 
for if David, being a man after God's own heart, did but trip, surely we are ready to fall down right. And yet we see that David did not only slide out of the way of human slipperiness, but also did fall into some great and notorious offences. David, therefore, was a saint, but he was no angel. It is an angel-like perfection to do the will of God in all things. The saints upon earth must pray for the same, and contend to come as near it as they can, and by their imperfection be instructed to humility, until by the grace of God in Jesus Christ they be brought into the same estate of perfection with the angels. In the person of Joab we have to consider two things, first the advice which he giveth, and secondly his execution of the king's commandment. Joab was a man, as his story declareth, endued with great courage and diverse other good qualities, and yet not simply to be commended, for there were great faults in him. He was a man in whom virtues and vices were almost equal, such a one as Elcibiades is described of the Grecians and Marius of the Romans. But his chiefest virtue was valiancy and courage, yet in his example he is noted by the Holy Ghost in giving counsel to David to be faint-hearted and coward-like. For first the Holy Ghost testifieth that he utterly misliked this enterprise of David, and as a man well acquainted with the affairs of the realm, and knowing there was not just cause why the people should be mustered, he did easily conjecture that the king's commandment proceeded of vain pride and presumption, and therefore he had no good will to execute it, insomuch that it is showed in the book of Chronicles that he did perform the king's precept negligently, for he not only omitted the number of the tribe of Levi, for which he might have some excuse, because they were addicted to the service of religion, but he also left out the tribe of Benjamin. The reason is alleged, because the king's commandment seemed abominable unto him, and as he did abhor and detest the king's commandment, so he showed diverse reasons of his misliking. For after protestation of his good will and desire of the king's honour, in that he wished the Lord might increase the people an hundredth times as many as they were, that the king might not suspect him as one that refused to take pains in his service, first he showeth that there was no sufficient cause of this muster, when he saith, Wherefore doth my lord the king desire this thing? And again he saith, Are not they all the servants of my lord the king? For one cause of numbering the people was used even of heathen princes, that the subjects thereby should profess their obedience." But at this time there was neither suspicion of war abroad, nor rebellion at home. Moreover, he did also insinuate that the king's transgression would be the cause of God's punishment to fall upon the people, where he saith, And why should this be an offence or guiltiness unto Israel? By using these reasons to dissuade the king from his evil purpose, he might seem to some men to have discharged the duty of a trusty and faithful counsellor. But the Holy Ghost noteth him of great frailty and faint-heartedness when he saith, Nevertheless the king's commandment prevailed with Joab and with the captains of the host. The rest, seeing the king's humour, held their peace and said nothing. Only Joab useth some speech to alter the king's mind. But perceiving with what affection the king was carried, he thought it was not best for him in policy to set himself altogether against the king's affection, though he bare the king good will, and wished to have him removed from that unprofitable attempt. Yet he does not adventure to incur the king's displeasure by doing his duty thoroughly, and discovering the hidden wound which he thought was too sore to abide any sharp medicine. For in such a case as this, he thought it was not best to be earnest and vehement a persuader, and so followed Machiavelli's philosophy two thousand years and more before Machiavelli was born. His cowardice in this case is rather to be noted, for that at other times he showed great courage and valiantness, and given such faithful advice and counsel that his example is worthy to be followed of all good counsellors. For in the nineteenth chapter of this book we read that when David, after the slaughter of Absalom, yielded so much to the natural affection of a father, in lamenting for the death of his unnatural son, that he forgot the duty of a king which was to encourage and reward his good subjects for their service, insomuch that when the people heard what lamentation he made for Absalom, 
they were clean discouraged, and came by stealth into the city, more like to men that had fled from the field, than such as had obtained so notable a victory against the king's enemies. As soon as Joab heard thereof, he came boldly into the king's presence, and with great courage he did the duty of a faithful counsellor, for he told the king of his fault plainly, and showed him the danger thoroughly. You have discouraged, saith he, the hearts, and made ashamed the faces of all your faithful servants, which have delivered your life and the lives of your wives, and of your sons and daughters, and have established the kingdom this day in your hand. You love them that hate you, and hate them that love you, for you have showed this day that you make no account either of your princes, nor of your people. For I perceive if Absalom had lived, and all we had been slain this day, you would have been well pleased with it. But now I advise you, leave your mourning, and go forth and speak comfortably unto the people, or else I swear unto you by the Lord, you will utterly alienate the minds of your subjects from you so that you shall not have one man tarry with you this night. And this affliction shall be greater than all the troubles and dangers you have sustained even from your youth. Whereupon David arose and went and encouraged his soldiers, so the kingdom was established in his hands. You see how roughly and effectually Joab dealt with the king in that case. But at this time he is noted to have dealt faintly and timorously. For although he opposed some reason against the king's unlawful desire, yet he did it with a weak arm, and so of frailty failed of his duty. Concerning the execution of the king's commandment, there is some controversy. Whether Joab should have obeyed the king's precept, when he knew it proceeded from an evil affection. The time will not serve me to discuss the reasons on both the sides, therefore I will speak of the case briefly and generally. If the prince command anything to be done, which of itself is unlawful and against the commandment of God, that commandment of any subject is not to be executed, for we are so bound to obey earthly princes that we disobey not the God of heaven and earth, and therefore Joab should have suffered death, rather than to have obeyed David's commandment in betraying and murdering of Uriah with the sword of the Ammonites, which was a faithful subject and a valiant captain. I say he should have suffered death rather than to have executed such a commandment, because the fact was altogether ungodly and unlawful of his own nature. But in this case, where the fact of his own nature was indifferent and lawful of itself, as to number the people, in some cases, is not only lawful but also necessary. If Joab had done his duty thoroughly in admonishing the king of his corrupt affection, and of the vengeance of God like to ensue if he proceeded therein, and that when he had done all that he could and ought to have done to dissuade him, his advice would take no place, but the king would still urge his commandment, and enforce Joab's obedience, I see no cause but that he might have executed the king's commandment. The conclusion of the whole matter, because I see the time is past, and I would be loath to abuse your honourable patience too long, in few words is this. The justice of God is set forth to this end, that we might be afraid by sin to provoke his wrath. The malice of Satan is described, that we might be careful to beware of it, and by faith to withstand it. The frailty of man is showed, that, seeing our weakness, we might be humbled thereby, and taught to seek for strength only at the hands of God, whose grace, through our Lord Jesus Christ, shall be sufficient for us. To whom, with the Holy Ghost, one eternal and everlasting God, be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. End of A Godly and Learned Sermon Preached Before an Honourable Auditory, the 26th day of February, 1580, by William Fulke.